In January 1987, over seven months before the North American release of The Legend of Zelda, Namco decided to beat Nintendo to the punch with a gold cartridge of their own. The first on any Nintendo system. Sorry, Link. And that's not the only first this game is known for. You see, Namco had decided to port their wildly popular arcade dungeon crawler to the family computer. The game originally released in 1984, and is cited as the first ever double jump in any video game. And as far as I can tell, it's also the first game to feature a downward thrust with a sword. It's Dragon Buster for the family computer, and it'll bust you up. Dragon Buster is one of those games that just doesn't seem worth the effort at first. The clunky movement, the cryptic controls, the busy background music, and the severe difficulty. It's one of those games that you just have to break in a little bit, like a new pair of boots. It kind of hurts to play at first, but once you get used to it, the game actually opens up and becomes a lot of fun. Pure, addicting, dungeon crawling, ARPG bliss. In Dragon Buster, you play as Clovis, the son of the chief bodyguard to the king of the royal Lawrence family. According to the manual, Clovis was a mischievous youngster, so his father shipped him off to live with a monk who lived in the woods at the far edge of the kingdom. And the kingdom isn't even named, by the way. It's just the Lawrence family's kingdom. Clovis trained under the monk to become a master swordsman. And when the king's daughter, Celia, gets kidnapped by a dragon, he feels a sense of duty to try and save her and slay the dragon. In the Famicom version, you end up saving a good number of princesses though, not just her. And you also slay a good number of dragons. So how does Dragon Buster work? What do you do in it? Allow me to explain. Dragon Buster has four main components. An overworld, routes, dungeons, and a dragon fight at the end. These things combine to compose a round, and upon completing a round, you progress to the next one. There are 12 main rounds, and the difficulty increases as you progress in a variety of ways. There are also 12 more rounds in addition to the first 12, but let's just start with the original 12. As you go along, the routes become harder to plan, as you can't always see the best way forward. The dungeons grow larger, and the enemies and mini bosses within them grow more difficult, dealing more damage and taking more hits to defeat. You regain a certain percentage of your health after finding an exit to each dungeon, but only after completing a round is it guaranteed to restore to maximum. There are a good number of items in the game to assist you, but they only drop from mini bosses, and the mini bosses are actually referred to as room guardians. Most of your time in Dragon Buster is going to be spent in the dungeons. There are plenty of regular enemies that can chip away at your health, but what you really have to watch out for are the room guardians. The skeleton, which is a formidable swordsman. The fafnil, which is like a fire-breathing long neck. The wizard, which is easily the most annoying and dangerous of the bunch with his fireballs and his flying daggers. And lastly, the bishop, which I found the easiest personally to take out with the downward thrust of the cold steel of my blade. Oh, you like the steel of my blade? It's so cold. One thing though, all of them can juggle you, and it's really entertaining to watch. The regular enemies are mostly just quickly moving targets to slash through, but I'll elaborate on the ones that can potentially cause trouble. The snake is a basic enemy that seems quite harmless at first, but I found it can actually bite you and leech health, which is kind of surprising. The golem is an excessively tall regular enemy that almost always requires two hits to fell. They're too tall to double jump over, so you either have to be really careful or just tank through them like I did. The cave shark is the most dangerous regular enemy, and you can't stop it from an 
initially latching on, and it takes a lot of hits to get off your back. This enemy only appears if the game decides you're taking too long to find the mini boss that grants you the exit door, but it's really more of a relic of the fact that this was originally designed for arcades and they don't want to allow some tool to just hog the machine all day. But some of the later stages, the dungeons get so long and they're so samey and confusing and easy to get lost in that it's, you know, I really wish they had removed the cave shark. And then the final interesting regular enemy for me was the ghoul. They cannot be defeated by the sword alone, so you have to constantly slash at it in order to push it away, or you can use a spell in the form of a consumable. But typically you want to save those for when you really need them. If one appears in a boss room, you can jump over it with the double jump, but that is a rare occurrence. It mostly just serves as something that forces you to spend a consumable. And then there are the dragons, and they're very well done. The first time you face one, you're likely to die because they're a bit intimidating and they actually punish cautious and careful play. They can back you into a corner and force you to use your consumables if you're not quick enough. The best strategy is to just rush them and attempt to get up close to get multiple body part hits at once for more damage. And true to the name, Busting up dragons is actually the most satisfying part of Dragon Buster. It's something to look forward to each round. Now for the controls. They're pretty standard, but there are actually a few advanced techniques with the sword and the double jump requires pretty quick timing as there is a short window in which one is allowed after your initial jump. A is jump, B is swing. Left and right move as you'd expect, but you can also tap double jump and hold in a direction to sprint, which is extremely useful. Down plus A allows you to use an item equipped and you can view and swap between items in the pause menu with the D-pad. In the air, you can hold down plus B to do a downward thrust. And off a single jump, you can actually perform an aerial forward thrust, but this is a little tricky to pull off without muscle memory. And it can also result in an accidental item consumption. Now, there are a lot of different items in Dragon Buster, but not all of them do things that are really that different from one another. Mostly, it's just a ranged attack in the form of a consumable. But certain kinds of items actually stay with you. An axe, which lets you chop down woods in the overworld, which can help you find a different route, and potentially skip a bunch of extra dungeons. A sword, which indicates a permanent increase of your sword's damage, but it actually can be stolen by a certain enemy. And then also there are shields which can prevent you from taking damage from the flying daggers that the wizard has. But what I personally found while playing this game is that you're not going to make it that far if you're too worried about the items. You really just have to focus on getting good with the sword. The items are more of a last resort or something to get past a ghoul or something when your health is very low. You don't really want to use your consumables. The best thing to do is just stockpile them. There is actually one thing that lets you continue your game, and that is an item in the form of a diary. I got one, and I did end up using it in one of my playthroughs. It came in super clutch. But other than that, if you die, you're toast. One interesting thing about Dragon Buster is the box art is actually really fantastic, and the box itself just, I feel it's worth mentioning because it is solidly constructed. There's a space to put the manual and it just has a really nice presentation to it. Ultimately, I think I prefer the cardboard boxes, just the looks of them, but this is something special. And additionally, the box art itself does a really good job of showing what exactly the game's about. You can see the shadow of a dragon, Clovis, the princess, and then in the background, you see the map. The map is something that makes this game more interesting. It really takes it to the next level. And your strategy when approaching the overworld can make or break a run. It can be the difference between like four or five extra dungeons in the later rounds. And when it comes to the dungeons in Dragon Buster, it's somewhat random, but not totally random. What boss you encounter in any given mini boss room might be different from the last time you played, but the doors will always drop from the same rooms. So this allows you to build upon your failures. And while 12 rounds might seem like a lot at first when you're still learning the mechanics of the game, you just kind of need a few good runs like once you get to like world seven you start to feel the fire you feel like this is the run like i might make it all the way this time 
And once the game opens up and you see that it's not always obvious where to go, it just triggers something. It just gets more interesting. It's exciting. It's like, ooh, suddenly this dungeon crawling action RPG, suddenly it feels like I'm actually exploring something bigger, something vast. I generally know the direction I need to go, but I don't know what obstacles are in the way. And that is very cool. You see, there's just something addicting about this game. At first you really are just like, wow, okay. The movement's not great. The sword swing is awkward. The graphics are weird. I'm not sure how I'm feeling about this, but then after trying it a few times, it got to the point where I was kind of just like, I feel like playing a little Dragon Buster, I think. I think I feel like playing Dragon Buster. And, um, you know, not every game does that to me. I don't always get an itch, even if I really like a game. I don't always have an itch that I feel I need to scratch. And Dragon Buster actually provides that. Now, it's not a perfect game, but it does a lot of interesting things. Overall, Dragon Buster is simple and complex at the same time. There's a lot to it. But really, the game is best enjoyed if you just forget about it and just play. I think simplicity is the way to go to enjoy Dragon Buster. I was pretty impressed by how fun it was. And uh, a lot of times, arcade games are just not my style because I'm not really a high score type of gamer. I'm an adventure type of gamer. an elite type of gamer, a major league gamer, if you will. So overall, I was pretty impressed by Dragon Buster. It's not a perfect game, and it does suffer a little bit from that arcade mentality in the port, but it's a pretty good port, and it's pretty fun, and it's a real shame that it never really came over onto the NES. I think this would have been a big hit on the NES, especially if they had managed to do the port a little earlier. Between the flashiness of the gold cartridge and everything, I was expecting a worse game, I'll be honest. Haven't ever really heard of this game, really, outside of research, and it's just not something I ever see anyone bring up but it's a lot of fun. I think anyone who is into these kinds of games or even things like, you know, roguelikes or roguelites, those styles of games, you know, you should try Dragon Buster. And don't give up after the initial kind of, just like push through a little bit. You'll see what I'm talking about. This episode is a little shorter than usual, but it's kind of a little bit shorter of a game. And there's nothing wrong with that. To all you guys who keep coming back, keep commenting, you're the reason I am still making these. Thank you so much for watching. Peace. Hey, you very good. See you next time.